We begin with the final masterpiece of Manet's life, the bar at Folie Bourgier. Uh And this is always a very complex painting to kind of try to dissect because of the uh, different layers of reflection that are actually in it. Uh, we have a bar woman who's standing in front of a mirror, and the mirror is reflecting uh, what we have in the background, but then we also have this gentleman uh, over on our right side, and if we kind of put this into perspective, uh, he would actually be sitting to our left uh, and not necessarily connected directly with what we think of as the barmaid. Uh, again, this is kind of a complex relationship, but a lot of this is just merely a reflection of uh, the modern technology of the time. We have multiple studies leading into this composition, uh, with Manet actually doing several paintings beforehand, and we have the model actually featured uh, beforehand in a few of Manet's paintings as well. Uh, again, this is kind of a culmination of a lot of the different thematics we have uh, from Manet. We have this idea of, uh, uh, again, the cafe scene, uh, and then we have the modern technology of the mirror uh, being present as well. Uh, again, this idea of making a large uh, a mirror is probably something that's very newer to the time, but we also have that sense of isolation that we uh, uh, encounter in a lot of Manet's paintings uh, around this time period, uh, uh, kind of focusing on, uh, as I mentioned, this, this aspect of daily life within Paris. And, you know, maybe this is also an autobiographical aspect of Manet. Maybe he felt uh, a disconnection with the society that he was actually in, that there was a lot of interaction between people, but at the same time, uh, this sense of loneliness probably prevailed. When we look at this and we kind of uh, this is another painting uh, of, of the exact same subject matter. You kind of get a better understanding uh, of the proximity of things. And again, uh, the mirror that we are speaking of on the right might be actually a a curved mirror and, and uh, as I mentioned the, the the reflection of the gentleman that we're looking at uh, is actually going to be around to the side of us uh, as it is thought we don't really actually know there's been a lot of work kind of pulling out the different perspectives of what actually occurs within this but in some ways I think that's kind of almost a loss of, of the point and, and that is really uh, again, the culmination of what we think of as contemporary life, uh, along with all of these other kind of uh, aspects that we see within the work of Manet and, and also some of the other uh, artists working at the time, this discovery of the contemporary modern society. And again, this is a newer thing, not only in terms of the art, uh, but in the society itself. There's a lot of uh, a rebuilding that occurs in Paris right around this time. So a lot of this is showing uh, the newer Paris as well. One of the final models we see very actively in the compositions is Marie Leroux. Uh, and we see a photograph of her, uh, but also a nice little pastel, I believe, uh, that Manet actually did of her as the time. Uh, we have a couple instances of her uh, to kind of examine. Again, she was, a, a, I imagine, a friend and also a model for um, Manet at this time. But again, uh, when we examine the life of Manet, we are reminded of the fact that this is really, uh, in terms of his physical uh, aspects, really the decline. Uh, here we have a few more images of her uh, in various situations and outfits. Again, uh, if we think about the earlier piece that we saw uh, with the woman with the black and the white contrast, this is very similar to what we see here with Marie Lara uh, on the right. But again, uh, uh, as, as a reminder, we do have the, the general decline of his health, and this is also getting very close to the time uh, when he does have his foot amputated, which completely, uh, again, kind of uh, uh, really does mark the end of, of, of the, the, the major aspects of his life. As we kind of continue, uh, we see less and less work. Uh, that you would imagine someone could do uh, with with very little mobility. Uh, we also have kind of a continuation, if not a conclusion, uh, to kind of the military aspects of uh, uh, Manet's painting in the Bugler from 1882. And again, when we look at the, the brushstrokes and his handling of this, uh, it's a very, very different painting than the young uh, boy playing a fife uh, that we saw 
from the very early part of Manet's career. Uh, again, it's almost interesting to imagine that boy growing up into this gentleman uh, still serving in the military. But again, uh, if you look at things like the gentleman's hand that's not holding the bugle, uh, you can kind of see the lack of definition, uh, this, this kind of over um, abstraction that we have. So he retires to kind of a house, if you will, a real maison. Uh, and you can see kind of the garden from here. Uh, again, a lot of the work that we see from 1882 uh, from this later period of his life is centered around this house, uh, painting from the garden, and, and I imagine also painting uh, mostly from the interior. Uh, again, but these paintings towards the end of his life, he must have been uh, in excruciating pain, and, and I imagine extremely depressed given his physical state. Uh, we still get this nice a collection of, of, of uh, painterly aspects. Again, uh, we, we see the brush strokes that, that he's kind of uh, mastered through the way of the Impressionist, uh, going into things like the garden outside uh, when we look at the foliage, but then we also have this kind of pullback towards aspects of reality uh, that we saw the very, very early aspects of his life where, uh, again, he was a realist painter much more than anything else. Uh, so I think at the very end here, when we look at these final paintings, we have, uh, again, a lot of them centered around this aspects of immobility uh, that we will see in, in Manet. Uh, a lot of these kind of have this bringing together of, of different ideologies uh, that he had throughout his life. Uh, it's almost as if uh, when, when we get to the end here that, that the, the, the subject matter uh, becomes one that he is able to kind of bring everything together. A uh, vase of white lilacs and roses, as it says, is, is the second to last painting we have by him. Uh, and towards the very end, this is really what we do see is a lot of uh, still life work. Again, if we uh, can imagine the, the ease by which uh, someone can, can sit and paint uh, a still life it seems very appropriate uh, uh, that at this point of immobility he would be kind of embracing this subject matter. Uh, so as we kind of conclude his existence, and, and again he dies with complications, uh, not only from the syphilis but also from the, uh, uh, the amputation of his foot, he really does have a lasting legacy uh, in terms of the art world. When we look at uh, uh, the, the importance that he has as a transition artist uh, between what we think of as the earlier groupings of the Romantics uh, into the Realist, into what we think of as the newer generation of the Impressionists, uh, he really is kind of the key figure that we look at as kind of our connecting piece. Uh, in addition to that, he's also a person we look at as a person openly challenging uh, the salon uh, and, and establishing the uh, or uh, challenging the establishment uh, and the concepts of painting that they had actually embraced, uh, but doing it by way of the establishment itself.